Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Poker Blog. This is going to be episode 25, and it is at Resorts World, and it is on Saturday, October the 28th. So we get into some interesting hands. I make some interesting calls uh, on the river, so stay tuned for that. And let's see what else. Uh, I butcher pocket kings again, so uh, you guys get to, to watch me play pocket kings poorly um, in a multi-way pot. So stay tuned for the poker hands. Before we get into the poker hands, though, some of you have noticed my album collection in the back, and some of you have commented on the albums that I keep up here in the now playing section and have asked me to give kind of an overview of some of the albums. I don't want to call them a review, an album review, but I'll call it like an album suggestion. So I'm going to start making some suggestions weekly uh, or maybe every other week on the vlog. We'll get into an album suggestion. And in this week's episode, in the spirit of Halloween, we're going to talk about Goblin's album, the soundtrack to the film Suspiria. Suspiria is a Dario Argento film from the 1970s. Dario Argento is an Italian filmmaker most known for horror movies, scary movies, Halloween type movies. And... Um, Suspiria is a story about witches um, in a ballet school. Highly recommend watching the film if you haven't seen it. It is gory, so trigger warning. Um, if you're not into that type of stuff, I wouldn't recommend it. But if you have a strong enough stomach to tolerate some of the gory aspect of it, it's an interesting watch. They did a remake of it not that long ago. I want to say it was like in the 2015, 2016 era, somewhere in there. They did a remake. I've not seen the remake, but I have heard from other reviews that it is good and worth watching. Uh, different than what Dario Argento does, but I've heard that it is its own thing and it's worth um, checking out. So anyway, Enough about the movie, let's get into the music. So Goblin is an Italian progressive rock band. And they did multiple soundtracks for Dario Argento films. Suspiria's one, Zombie's another one. And I'm not a big soundtrack guy, but this isn't your typical soundtrack. So it's got a very progressive rock lean to it but it is also very dark and atmospheric so it gives you that chilling sense of dread while at the same time giving you some good rock that you might uh you might enjoy so anyway uh i highly recommend checking it out here hold on a second i'm gonna grab the record all right, so here's the album, Goblin, Suspiria. You can see all the stuff on there. Dario Argento. Anyway, uh, this is on vinyl. It's on colored white vinyl. It's a reissue. It's not an original press for all of you vinyl nerds out there like me. Uh, you don't have to get it on vinyl. I, pref I prefer, you know, when I'm at home to listen to records on, on vinyl. You can find it on any streaming service. I think it's on Spotify, it's on Pandora. You could probably find it on YouTube. Uh, I'm sure you could find it on pretty much any of the major streaming platforms. So um, you don't have to have it on vinyl. I do recommend the reissue. It is a nice, clean listen and the sound quality is good. So if you are gonna buy the vinyl record, uh, don't spend a ton of money on a, an original press, just get the reissue. Uh, I don't think it's worth, you know, unless you're a hardcore collector, I don't think it's worth getting the um, original press or anything like that, you know, trying to seek out some expensive copy of it. So I would just grab the reissue 
And that is my album suggestion for Halloween. Goblins soundtrack to the Dario Argento film Suspiria. Check it out. Let me know what you think in the comments. Curious to hear if you enjoy it. If you think it's too weird, um, let me know. All right, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get into the poker hand. So again, this is Resorts World, October 28th. Enjoy the poker hands. I'll see you all at the table. We are back at Resorts World trying to get a little redemption after our poorly played last session here at this property. First playable hand I pick up is Ace King of Diamonds under the gun. I go ahead and decide to raise this up. I make it 10 to go. Folds over to the cutoff who decides to put in the $10 call. Everyone else decides to get out of the way here, so we're going to end up going heads up to a flop, which is the ideal scenario when you raise a hand like Ace, King of Diamonds under the gun, because we're going to be out of position the entire hand here. So glad to see it go heads up. Not too happy, though, to see the exact flop of Queen 1010 with two diamonds. But I think we can still fire a continuation bet here and get our opponent to fold a lot of their middling pocket pairs. And maybe even hands like Ace Jack might get out of the way here as well. So we bet, cut off quickly calls, and we see the Eight of Clubs on the turn. Not a great card, so I slow down and check. But cut off decides to check back here, and we see the Ace of Hearts on the river. I think we can now bet for value, albeit very thin value, to get calls from hands like Ace Queen, Queen Jack, King Queen, etc. So I make it 16 to go. The cutoff hems and haws a bit about ace on the river and folds his hand and we end up taking down a small pot here with our ace king we pick up another premium holding this time we are upgraded to pocket kings and we are in the cutoff better yet we see a raise from an under the gun player who's turned out to be somewhat of an action player at this table middle position player calls and the hijack calls now it's on me, and I have a question here of whether or not I want to raise or slow play my premium hand. I think we definitely want to be bumping up the price of poker here. 65. So the question is how much. I decide to go with $65 as the three-bet sizing. The original Razor pretty much snap calls this three-bet. Leaves me a little concerned that the other two players might decide to tag along here as well. As I mentioned, the under the gun player is the action player at the table, but they both decide to get out of the way and we are gonna go heads up here in a three bet pot. Unfortunately, the flop is the dreaded ace high flop, ace jack five rainbow. Not the exact flop you wanna see when you have pocket kings in a three bet pot. But when the under the gun player checks it over to me, I think we can continue to represent all of our strong hands here, ace king suited, Ace-Queen suited, 
ace jack suited, pocket aces, pocket kings, pocket queens, pocket jacks. We've got all of those in our three betting range. So I decide to down bet here and I make it 40 to go. It's back over to the under the gun player who acted very quickly pre-flop, but takes his time on this flop. And he doesn't look too comfortable here. So I'm not immediately thinking he has an ace, or if he does, he might have a weak ace that he called with pre-flop. Maybe a hand like ace-10 suited or ace-9 suited. And he's not too comfortable and doesn't want to get into a big pot. He does put in the call, so we're going to go to a turn, which is a pretty safe card. It's the eight of hearts. Does bring in a backdoor flush, although I don't think that's super relevant in this situation. Under the gun player decides to check again. And I decide to exercise some pot control here on this turn. I don't think we want to get into a huge pot here with second pair. We see the five of clubs on the river pairing the board. And now the under the gun player is counting out chips for a bet. Curious to see what sizing he settles on here. He decides to put in a wager of $105 making the pot $360. We don't have to be right here too often to make this a profitable call. We've got to call 105 to win 360. I really don't think my opponent is super strong. I also think he's capable of turning a hand like queen jack or king jack into a bluff. I think he's also capable of bluffing with smaller pocket pairs. So I decide we're going to be calling here. I flick in the one chip call, he says you're good and turns over pocket sevens. And our pocket kings are gonna take down a $465 pot here. I'm glad I took some time to think this through on the river and ultimately settled on the right action and made the call. I knew he didn't have an ace either, so. No, if he went all in, I'd be in a bad spot. Just when you think you're making good decisions, your ego gets in the way and you start making poor decisions. We look down at pocket kings again. This time we are in the big blind. Under the gun player folds. Middle position player decides to put in the $3 call. The hijack player decides to raise this up. He makes it 18 to go. Cutoff gets out of the way. Small blind folds and it's back over to me and I decide to just call here and get tricky. This invites the limper along as well. So we're gonna go three ways here to a flop. Should have raised this pre-flop, put in the three bet to get this heads up. But as played, we see a flop of eight, seven, four with two diamonds. I check it over to the middle position player who limped who now decides to put in a donk bet. He leads out into the pre-flop aggressor, and this gets the pre-flop razor out of the way. He decides to fold. The bet is $30 to go, and it's back over to me now, and my hand is severely underrepped here. We don't have a diamond in our hand, so I think we want to be raising here and trying to rep a very strong hand like pocket jacks, pocket queens, pocket kings, pocket aces. So I settle on a sizing of $90 to go. I put in the check raise here. Not sure if this is the best play, if this is the best spot to be check raising. Let me know what you all think about this check raise in the comments below. Curious to hear your feedback. The player in the middle position now, Tank, looks at his hand counts out chips, looks at his hand, and eventually settles on a call. So after somewhat deliberating about what to do, he decides to move forward here and put in the call. Not sure what this Hollywooding means. I didn't want to put too much into it. Maybe he's doing it as an act. Maybe it's genuine and he was uncertain as to what to do here, but he did settle on a call, so we're going to continue on here, heads up to a turn card, which connects the board even more. It's the nine of clubs. Not my favorite card, so I decide to slow down and check here. When I check, 
The player in middle position almost instant shoves his entire stack. When he jams here, I don't really feel like we are going to be ahead all that often. I think he can have a lot of the sets, hands like pocket sevens, pocket eights, pocket fours. Definitely feel like he is ahead here, could be ahead potentially, and is trying to protect his hand. And he's putting us on the flush draw here. We're getting a pretty poor price to call. So I think the best thing to do here is just fold. And that's what I decide to do. I let our cards go and we live to fight another day. I think the lesson on this hand is three bet your premium holdings preflop and try to isolate the weak players and get heads up. This is a night of premium holdings. This time we've got Ace King off suit under the gun. I make it 12 to go here, and we end up getting a couple of callers who decide to come along and join the party. Player in the cutoff decides to put in the call. The button decides to put in the call. And we get a call from the big blind here as well. So we're going to go four ways to a flop. Flop comes down, giving us top pair, top kicker, king, six, four with two spades. When the big blind checks it over to me, I definitely want to be continuing to bet here. I settle on a size of $25 to go, although I think I should be going a bit larger. This does the trick, and everyone does get out of the way. And we end up taking down a small pot here with our ace, king, off suit, and top pair, top kicker. And we just keep picking up the premium holdings. This time, the best premium holding in all of poker pocket aces. And better yet, we are on the button, the best position at the table. We do have one middle position limper in the pot. Everyone else gets out of the way when I make it 12 to go. But the limper puts in the call and we go heads up and we see a flop that's almost too good. Ace of diamonds, nine of clubs, four of hearts. I do decide to check back here and slow play this. This is one of the few spots where I do advocate slow playing because we have this board absolutely crushed. And when I bet $15 on the turn, he quickly folds. It's one of the negative side effects of flopping top set when you have pocket aces. It's just too strong of a holding. It's very hard to get action with that hand. We don't only play premium holdings, we also play middle pocket pairs like pocket eights, the snowmen on the button. We get a limp in middle position and we get a limp in the hijack. I raise this up, I make it 12 to go. Small blind decides to come along for the $12 raise and both limpers decide to go ahead and put in the call as well. So we are going to go multi-way here, four ways to a flop. Flop comes down all low cards. So we flop ourselves an over pair in position. Four, five, three, two clubs, one heart. Very connected board. But when it checks over to me, I think we can continue to get value here from flush draws, straight draws, and maybe even a hand like pocket sixes or pocket sevens. So I make it 25 to go, a half pot size bet. This gets the small blind to let his cards go. The middle position player who limp called decides to go ahead and call here on the flop as well. And the hijack decides to get out of the way. So we're gonna go heads up here to a turn. And the turn is the four of hearts. Middle position player checks it over to me. I decide to exercise a little bit of pot control here and check back. So we are going to go to a river, which brings in the backdoor flush. It's the seven of hearts. And now the middle position player doesn't think too long before counting out a bet. He makes it $50 to go here on this river card. I'd seen this player bluff in two previous hands, and he'd only been at the table for maybe 30 minutes. So I know he is capable of bluffing. If he has a missed flush draw, like a missed club draw, he certainly would bet here. I think he's also capable of turning over cards into a bluff. So if he's got a hand like ace queen or ace jack, he would turn that into a bluff here as well. We're not getting a bad price here to call. So I count it out and I put in the call. And indeed, he turns over king jack off suit. And our pocket eights are good here. 
and we take down this $201 pot with the snowmen. From a middle pocket pair to a small pocket pair, this time we've got pocket fours in middle position. I decide to just call the $3 here pre-flop. I've been taking a limp call line with these small pocket pairs. Let me know if you think we should be raising here with these in middle position. As played, I limp. Player to my direct left makes it 12 to go. The button puts in the call and the big blind puts in the call. So we are going to end up going four ways to a flop after I put in the call. And we're just hoping the dealer can put out a four one-time dealer. No, unfortunately not this time. Ace, three, queen, rainbow, big blind checks. I decide to go ahead here and check. Original razor checks. And now the button makes it 16. Pretty small bet, but it's going to be enough to get the job done. Everyone decides to fold, and the button wins this pot in position. Last hand of the session, we've got ace, queen of spades. We are in the small blind. Under the gun player decides to limp. Middle position player decides to make it 11 to go. Folds over to me, and I decide to just call the $11 preflop raise here. Big blind decides to put in the call, and the limper decides to put in the call as well. So we're going to end up going four ways here to a flop. Flop ends up giving us a pair with a backdoor flush draw. Queen, deuce, king with two diamonds. I check, big blind checks, and now the under-the-gun player who limp called decides to donk bet 15. Middle position player who originally raised calls. I decide to put in the call here and the big blind calls as well. So we're going to go four ways to a turn, which is the ace of diamonds, bringing in the front door flush, bringing in the royal flush. I check, big blind checks, and the under the gun player now makes it 20. Original razor folds, I call, and the big blind folds, and we see the jack of hearts on the river. Goes check, check, and we end up winning with our top two pair here to end the night. All right, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed the poker hands. I hope you enjoyed the album suggestion. If you did, please do hit that like button. Give it a thumbs up. Hit the subscribe button. Helps out the channel a lot. And hit that notification bell so you don't miss future episodes. We're going to be traveling coming up here this next week. So I'm going to be hitting up some new casinos and some new poker rooms. And we're going to have our first episode on the vlog outside of the state of Nevada. So stay tuned for that. Thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in on the vlog. If you have any questions, any suggestions, any feedback, please leave it in the comments below. And I will see you in the next episode. Peace. Hey, everyone. I almost forgot to go over the numbers for this episode. So I just wanted to record that really quickly. We were in the game for $400 and we cashed out for $661. That's a profit of $261. I'll put the totals up over here somewhere. Thank you guys so much for the support. Please do like the vlog. Hit the subscribe button. I'll see you all in the next episode. Take care.